the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David chats with Jesus Revolution director Brent McCorkle. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome, everyone, to the weekly show. I'm your host, David J. Maloney. This week, we talk to a director whose work includes the films Unconditional, and I can only imagine, and whose latest film is one of the most anticipated films of the season, Jesus Revolution, starring Kelsey Grammer and Jonathan Rumi. We've got none other than director Brent McCorkle with us tonight, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Our featured guest tonight introduced himself to the broader world with the release of his debut film, Unconditional, starring Lynn Collins and Michael Ely, and now brings his talent and skill once again as co-director on the hotly anticipated feature film, Jesus Revolution, starring Kelsey Grammer and Jonathan Rumi. Here to chat about the film and his work is none other than Brent McCorkle. Brent, welcome to the show. It's so good to be on with you, man. Thanks for having me on. So I'd like to uh, learn a little bit about your biography. Where did you grow up and what was life like for you there? Well, I was the pastor's kid. I grew up uh, mainly in Texas. I spent a brief time in Missouri and I loved the snow there. But um, but yeah, my dad wanted to uh, start a church from scratch in Texas. So we left everything that we knew and loved behind in Missouri. And when I was 10, we moved to Texas and started a church with just the four of us, me, my brother, my mom, and my dad. And, um, you know, it was really cool to see what my dad did. He taught me how to chase big dreams. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I got to ride along on it with his big dream and, uh, it turned out really good, man. He's, he's a very beloved pastor and a lot of people still call him pastor after he's been retired uh, from from that for decades. And so, so yeah, it's been really cool. And so uh, I was a creative kid, a little bit adrift, but growing up in the church, it was really cool because they really, a lot of churches really nurture creatives. They really nurture artists. And so I, I was given a safe place to learn how to play piano and sing and be pretty terrible at it to start out with. And then over time, you know, I got better and, um, acted in some dramas, sang in some musicals. And I really, I don't know if you're familiar with any Malcolm Gladwell work, but he, he says, if you, if you want to get good at anything, practice with effort and intensity for 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours. Yeah. From there, I, um, I, I got married. I had kids. I, I, um, got into a career and late in life, again, this kind of a drift artist. I didn't realize how much of an artist I was, but after I switched majors five times, you know, and was married, I realized I wanted to be a filmmaker. I, I'd always loved movies since I was a kid. And so I went to to college here in the Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas area, took some film classes and started making a bunch of short films. And some producers saw me, I'd made about 50 short films at, at that point. So some producers saw one of my shorts in a film festival and they invited me to to be their filmmaker for the movie that you you said at the top unconditional so i moved my whole family similar to my dad moved my whole family to nashville and uh made that movie and that was my first feature and, and from there i i um met john and andy and have had multiple multiple wonderful collaborations with those guys and jesus rev i think being by far the the greatest one so far uh, were there films or certain experiences that made you decide you wanted to pursue cinema as a career? I had an, an awesome experience when I was younger. I tell this story a lot, uh, but uh, my dad, you know, came home with a bootleg. He didn't even know it was a bootleg. It was just given to him by a friend of a friend, but it was a bootleg of Empire Strikes Back and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And if you're an 80s kid, you'll recall that both of those movies took forever to get to VHS. And so I, <laughs> I was one of maybe three kids in America that had those movies on tape. Uh, and my brother and I wore that VHS tape out. We stopped counting when we watched them 40 times each. And, wow. uh, and I've, I've probably seen Raiders and Empire now 60, 60, maybe 80 times. I just, I love those movies so much. And, um, what I was watching though, and marinating on and watching it over and over again, were two nearly perfect films. And so I, I think, I think it set the bar high in my brain with me not even knowing it, but yeah, definitely that was the pilot light lighting, you know, igniting. That was, that was definitely the ignition point for me was watching those two movies over and over again as a kid. 
What was the first Christian movie you ever saw? I mean, did you get lucky with something like Ben-Hur, The Ten Commandments, or maybe not so much with Bible Man, <laughs> like my producer's generation? Yes. Uh, I saw Ben-Hur as a kid, and it blew me away. It blew me away. It it in, it burned itself into my brain. Uh, what a beautiful movie. And it's so great that you would invoke Ben-Hur. Um, and I... And I actually, I actually brought up Ben Hur at a symposium, like a conference, and I never got invited back. But but it was all these people going, "I want to make you know the greatest Christian films ever," and you know I want to da da da. And I was like, "Well, how much time have you put into it?" Well, you know nothing. I was like, "You need to go watch Ben Hur, and see what's possible because what you're talking about without putting any time into it, it's going to be terrible." But like Ben Hur, man, like that is Hollywood bringing all of its forces to bear on a faith based concept. And it is that movie is amazing. I mean, it just stands up. It holds up to the test of time and some of the greatest action sequences, even when they tried to redo it. Like you just can't get back there. It's just the most amazing. Some of the most amazing, you know, Hollywood at the height of its power cinema ever made. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but uh, when you look at films like this, when you look at um, uh, Jonathan Rumi's other project, The Chosen, when you look at uh, there's uh, there seems to be I don't want to call it a movement, um, but there there and you've got uh, studios like Lionsgate that normally you wouldn't have studios that would get behind uh, faith based you know, productions. And do you see that there's maybe being a change and maybe a little bit of the film culture, or are they just recognizing now that there is a profit center in things like this that they didn't recognize before. So they're now willing to make the investment. It's both. It's both simultaneously. So what you have is some, the film kids that are slowly growing up and like, I just turned 50, but over, over decades of time, you, you beat yourself up, you whip yourself. You want to be better and better and better at every at every pass. So the people that have stayed in faith that actually care about the quality that actually love Hollywood's bar, those people were, were continuing to get better. You know, so like if you even look at my movies, like they've continued to improve because I'm working actively to do that. That's one thing I applaud about John and Andy and Dallas Jenkins. Uh, we have this high benchmark of quality in our value system, whereas a lot of Christian filmmakers don't. And that, that breaks my heart, honestly. I think if you're going to attach Jesus to something or God, you know, it better, <laughs> it better rock, you know, it better like destroy <laughs> out there. Like it better be excellent. So other than your own film, Unconditional, what was the first movie of the modern faith-based film era that made you go, okay, this is different. This is actually a good film on its own merits. <laughs> Yes. Oh, man. Um, can I ask you some questions? You know, I guess I was like, what would you for me? It's it's always so dicey to get into this stuff because I have a different take on faith films. So I think there's they're like faith films that are designed to entertain Christians. And then there are films that just grapple with faith and they're they're made for the mainstream, but they have a faith component. So I guess in your mind, which of those? Well, the interesting thing is, is I I had the opportunity to get uh, to, to pre-screen. Jesus Revolution. My, I, I went into that theater thinking it was going to be the latter, thinking that it was going to be a story that was on its own merits that might have a faith-based undertone. And I came out, let's put it this way, it snuck up on me. I, I came out going, you know, oh, wow, this has a much stronger faith component to it. It's still... Here it stood on its own merits, but it also still, I mean, there were three times in the movie where I shed tears. Yeah. Um, awesome. And, 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 uh, and my wife, she shed tears throughout it. Um, she was touched very much by it. So, so it's interesting because I, and I see how you're saying there's di this dichotomy between the two. I think, I think your present movie kind of, I think blended it well. Ah oh, man, that makes me so happy. So uh, the reason why I say that is, <clears throat> there are movies uh, that I that are so faith affirming to me, but so, are offensive to others because like, well, that's not Christian entertainment. That's that that doesn't affirm my faith. But like, so uh, M Night Shyamalan uh, signs, I'm very moved by the faith story in that. Uh, there's a little indie movie that Ryan Gosling did called Lars and the Real Girl, where he's mentally ill and the community comes around him and tries to help him, and they actually have. 
the thematic discussion of the film takes place in a church. And literally the priest asks, well, what would Jesus do? And then they just get around this guy and start loving him. And that's just a mainstream indie movie. So there are movies like that that I really applaud because I think it's it's hard maybe in Hollywood to to Brit to do a faith uh, um, you know a faith adjacent uh, storyline um, and then but then you have like on, on the on other side of the spectrum you have films that are made for the church right and so so what's interesting with John and I uh, is we're different and. My, it was really cool directing this because we made the same movie. We were totally on the same page, but I think our hearts are go out to two different audiences. And so I think you, I think we might have threaded the needle on this one. Like my stuff, I just, I want it to go out to the mainstream. I want the atheists to watch it and cry. And I, I want the hardcore entrenched evangelicals, you know, to watch it cry and everybody in between because I do think there are universal themes. And I think, God's love is trying to get to us in a myriad of different ways. And I don't think that necessarily always has to be through preaching. Uh, but at the same time, John really has a heart for this underserved entertainment market, which is the Christians, because they have been, they have been underserved from Hollywood, let's be honest, you know, and I think that might be changing and, and, um, and I really hope that it is, but together, I think we threaded this needle perhaps. What led to your original team up with the Irwins uh, for like, I can only imagine, how did that come about? Yeah. Uh, we all had a mutual respect for each other. Um, we both had ties. We all had ties to Nashville. They had just done their first movie that came out the same year that unconditional did. And Andy called me up one day, he got, a, got my number from somebody and he said, Hey man, um, I really liked your movie. I saw it. And I really appreciate it. I'd love to work with you in the future. And it was just like kind of a, it was a call that blew me away because his, their movie did a lot better than mine, but, um, but he's like, yeah, in the future, I'm going to call you. I said, okay, cool. So um, they went to Sony and did mom's night out and then Woodlawn came around and there was going to be so much action in that and so much football that he knew he wanted a second editor. And he was like me, he just edited all of his own stuff by himself and that can wear you out, man. So he's like, bro, I need a, I need a co-pilot on this. And so he called me, I read the script. I loved it started doing Woodlawn uh, with him. I ended up getting to do some music and story consulting on it and, uh, and editing it with Andy. And it was just, it was awesome. I, I loved that experience. And, uh, and we segued right into multiple other projects. I can only imagine they really let me wear a lot of hats on that. And uh, that's where I started telling everybody I was the adopted uh, Irwin brother, you know, I was the third <laughs> Irwin brother. Um, but uh, yeah, man, we've, we've collaborated on five or six things now. Um, I feel very fortunate. John, John was really passionate about Jesus revolution. And he's really passionate about his next film that he's working on, um, called fearless, which is, uh, a, a Navy seal movie, a very amazing book. Um, so what happened was John still wanted to collaborate with somebody. So I got the invite to, to be the co on this and I brought my thing to it. John brought his thing to it. And we had the most amazing cast and crew on this and everybody brought their thing to it. And so it's definitely a movie that was raised by a village and we just had some amazing, amazing quality people. Uh, but yeah, the, to go back to your question, we met out of like a mutual affinity and respect because we're like these boys in the South, like trying to make life affirming, you know, redemptive, um, uplifting content. And, uh, and we had our first feature films come out, you know, the same year. So it, that's, that's how we found each other really. When was the idea or script for Jesus Revolution first brought to your attention? That's a great question. Um, we were working on Woodlawn. Woodlawn takes place in a similar time. Uh, it's a film about a school that had been recently desegregated. And the Jesus movement had started sweeping the country. And this chaplain goes in and then he's basically like, Hey guys, you need to put aside your differences. It's about Jesus and it's about the love of God. You guys need to like start loving each other. And they and they do. They kind of give into this thing and they get what they get kind of washed away in the in the Jesus movement. Well, in all of that, John was doing research as as any good director would, and he stumbled across this crazy psychedelic Jesus cover of Time magazine in 1971. And it just said Jesus Revolution. And he got 
really intrigued by it, started trying to hunt the article down and there, there was no digital archive of that article. So he ends up buying the collector's edition time magazine off eBay for $150. Um, so, but he cracks like a good investment it. now. Oh yeah. That's yeah. That, you know, that's, that's 150 bucks. We would put down easy. Uh, but he cracks the thing open and it's 10 pages of just amazing cinema and no one's covered this period well in cinema ever, uh, you know, as far as a, a feature, a narrative feature, to my knowledge, at least. Um, and so he comes in the next morning with that magazine. And I remember it sat on his desk for months, but he's like, guys, we got to do this. And, you know, we finished imagining him and, you know, we got out the door and Lionsgate came on as a partner and he was like, please, can we do this next? And they're like, man, you know, the music biopic, we, we want to keep going with that. And so, you know, they went on and did I Still Believe and everything. And that was great. So that was the first time it was delayed. Then they wrote the script and it was greenlit and everything and COVID shut it COVID. down the second time. Well, then the third time it wanted to mount up, you know, John and Andy were interested in other projects. And so I got invited to come on. And so seven years later and our third mount up for this, we actually made it and it's, you know, coming out in theaters 2023. And, um, and so, yeah, it's been a circuitous path to get it to the theater, but you hear that a lot from filmmakers, like stuff yeah. burns down and there's a little bit of embers and it revives and burns down again. And, you know, 10 years later, five years later, whatever it is, it, it, it you know ultimately gets made so that's that was definitely the case here it's been in a gestational period for almost a decade so it's it's very uh humbling but also uh exciting to see something that's cooked this long you know finally get served as a meal you know what did you know about the jesus movement before you read the script because ironically i was married in 2003 at a cavalry chapel myself but i was unaware of its history yeah i i was really educated on it when i started doing research so when john found that article and we had some downtime i started doing a ton of research for it and i found just some beautiful scenes and i would chunk those away and i ended up turning in like a small phone book dossier of like the stories and the anecdotes and the different ways places we could go with it uh, so I really was educated and um, entrenched in all of the Jesus movement stuff, Jesus culture, Jesus people. For me, it was newfound treasure. I, I didn't really know that much about it. And it it actually taught me things about my upbringing that I just took for granted or didn't really understand where it was all coming from. So even, you know, things I saw in Sunday school or like bumper stickers that people had on their car and stuff like that. But it was all from the Jesus movement. I was born in 1973. So you know, as the Jesus movement kind of had its heyday in 71, 72, I was born that next year. And uh, there was still, you know, a trickle effect all through the 70s uh, because of the Jesus movement. To answer your question, it was definitely getting pulled into the research for the for this movie. And it really was kind of a unique time in American history. You know, was there anything particularly crazy that you learned about the whole era while working on the film? Yeah, there was just such a despondency pretty much across the the world. You know, the there were political assassinations, JFK, Bobby, you know, Martin Luther King, the the epitome and the height of the civil rights movement, which continues today. You had our own state troopers gun down uh, American students on American soil. Uh, the Cold War. You know, the, the, the countercultural movement, all the kids dropping out uh, and just running away. I mean, it was a dark, dark time. It was divided. People were yelling at each other. And um, quite frankly, you know, people thought the world was going to end and that, that it was all going to be over. And so, so yeah, man, it was a, it was a, a wild time to drop into and think what it would be like. I think my mind took me back to what would it feel like if my president got assassinated like that that just had to be some sort of like the most immense psychic trauma to a nation that that could really happen um so i you know i tried to dwell on that and think about what that would feel like and all the uncertainty um but the interesting thing about it is i think we find ourselves in a uh, a similar place with the divisiveness and how divided our country is and everybody would rather scream at each other in all caps on Facebook than actually sit down and have a, uh, a civil conversation and agree to disagree.
you'd rather like it seems like it's gotten easy and i'm talking about outside the church but also inside the church maybe inside the church even more but it's got a lot easier to hate your enemy than it is to like sit down and have a conversation with somebody well that that's interesting so, because there seems to be a parallel with what you just said with certain scenes within the movie when the so-called hippies started to come into the church and the for lack of a better way of putting it church elders who were more conservative were none too pleased with these people with bare feet coming in and they were more concerned about their carpets getting you know saving their carpets than saving their souls yes man um i guess for me and this these words are kind of blistering and they're blistering to my heart too and they should be but there's there's your tradition and there's your your ideologies uh, politically or otherwise. And then there's what Jesus did. And Jesus hacked the traditionalist and the moralist of his time. And if, if he had just been a typical rabbi and just taught in synagogues and just stayed inside the synagogues and taught taught from the scripture, you would never know his name. There would not be a religion built around him. The whole idea of of what he was trying to show you was they're hurting people out in the world, get outside the church walls and go be with the people and love on everybody. He hung with the marginalized groups. He was criticized for them. He wasn't even culturally, he wasn't even supposed to talk to some of those people, but he did, you know? And so I don't know, man, I just find his life so inspiring and beautiful to me and, and loving. And he went out of his way to love and care and meet people's needs. And, um, it seems like the only time he would ever like raise his voice or get really frustrated was, was when tradition was getting in the way of actually loving God and following God and loving people. And so, so yeah, man, that, that's a little bit of my, uh, the, the drum that I bang, uh, uh, you know, I get, you get me, I get my dad's DNA coming up in me. I'll start preaching a little bit, but, um, that's, that's funny. Well, I don't necessarily disagree because in every faith and in every, um, uh, there, there's, there's always going to be some group that kind of is our modern day, uh, group of Pharisees. Yes. Yes. We, we did it and we gently did it, but we, uh, you know, there were preachers at the time that were just so adamant against, uh, the Jesus movement. They thought it was wrong. Um, and I just, I don't get it, man. I don't get it. Like everybody is made in God's image. Everybody's a child of God. Everybody is worthy of love. And Jesus said, even if you do choose to have political enemies um, in this country and you you actually view your neighbor who's flying whatever flag you don't fly in your yard, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if you view them as your enemy, uh, Jesus actually has a message for you too. Like we're, we're to love our enemies. And so... <laughs> So until we get back to that, you know, I think we're going to continue to be spun out as a culture. And and I'm talking to, to culture at large. I don't I don't want to pick on the church. I think it's pervasive and it's it's really uh, a virus that's infiltrated our entire culture. You know, and I, I hope when people go see our movie, they're just going to feel that this was crafted with so much love. And it's about a conversation and it's more like come to the table and let's talk. It's invitational and it's it's very loving and. And for me, I really feel the spirit move in that arena of like what we were trying to build as opposed to something that continues to divide. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. A special thanks to Brent McCorkle for joining us. Uh, he'll be joining us again next week for part two of our interview. Stay safe, everyone. Mm -hmm.